Well, you're covering a lot at this conference, and there's three things that we wanted to cover, and we'll cover them one at a time. Sure. Um, we, we love to hear the work that you're doing in uh, inflammation in mm -hmm. HIV. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that to us briefly? Sure. I think there's been, uh, there've been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of information recently about what, is, what happens exactly during the early stages of HIV disease, when until now we've thought that after people acquire HIV, is that there's a long period of time when they remain fairly healthy, and until their immune system is weakened and their T cells go down, and then they start manifesting all the complications with HIV. What we've discovered over the last few years is that during that long period that we assume things were very quiet or dormant, is that during that period of time there may be a storm going on in the body, a storm of inflammation, uh, where actually there may be ongoing damage uh, to organ systems, particularly concern about whether this inflammation may be affecting the, the liver, may be affecting the heart, the kidneys, even affecting the brain as well. So because of this data and this information about the importance of inflammation, particularly in these early stages of disease, there's been a lot of interest now in, uh, in sort of trying to reconceptualize HIV disease and re rethink that early phase of infection rather than it being a silent period, that it's a period of time when there's a potential for us to think of new treatments uh, that could be developed to try to dampen or prevent the, the storm that's you occurring in the body. Well, it's unclear whether it's going to be an immunological um, treatment or there are some people who think it might be that HIV treatment, the antiretroviral treatment itself, might have an effect. However, that's quite unclear and there's a need for uh, further research studies to see if, you, if using antiretroviral therapy during this early phase of early stages of HIV disease, whether that may have a benefit on, these, on inflammation in general. So that's and, this question that doesn't have an answer yet. Right. And, and what markers would you be using for the, to detect the inflammation? Well, based on the findings from the SMART study, there's two concerns. One is inflammation, one is coagulation. And they, they more or less are linked, and they go hand in hand, because coagulation also has the, the clotting, the ability of the blood to clot, may have a role as well in causing some other uh, complications, like heart attacks, right. for example. So. Um, so there are markers that have been looked at uh, through our work in the SMART study that include a variety of them, uh, C-reactive protein, CRP, IL-6, D-dimers, those are the ones that we looked at where there was a pretty good link between high levels of these markers and complications uh, shown in the SMART study. And the question is that uh, though in a patient population that's different, higher levels of CD4, earlier disease, whether we're going to see the same thing happening. Now, Tony Fauci was talking about a uh, concept of early treatment or treat, test and treat, yes, which yes. may give you an opportunity right. to test some of this out in practical ways. Right. I mean, it, it's just a thought at some point. Well, and actually, like there is a, there is know. a study. Is I don't know if you're aware of it. There's a study called Start. Right. That, that's that, going to take a, a long time. Well, it's yeah. already started enrolling yeah. patients yeah. actually, and that probably is the is the most rigorous, the most uh, accurate way that we're going to learn because in START, half of the people will get treatment, half will not get treatment for a while. And that's where you can see really what's the effect of treatment because you'll have a group that's getting treated and a group that's not, and you can compare uh, the changes in these markers in the, in the two groups. So that's probably the best medium through which we will really learn about the effect of treatment on should these markers. It should be a large stu trial that will it's give about us... about 4,000, yeah. planned to be about 4,000 patients. Yeah. Right. So, as far as treatment as prevention, yes. how do you how do you view that? Is that something? Uh, what is your perspective on it? Well, I think we have evidence already that treatment from observational studies done largely in Africa that people um, in, in couples where you have one person who's HIV positive, the other is not, is that if the person with HIV is on treatment, there's less of a chance of the other one acquiring uh, infection, and that makes a lot of sense because treatment decreases That's a the given. amount. It's given yeah. decreases the amount of virus in the bloodstream, so probably in the genital tract and so on. I think the question that's now open is, uh, and probably by just treating the people that need treatment, that, uh, that we have to reach as many of those who are eligible now for treatment, getting them into treatment, getting them to take their medicines regularly so that they can maintain viral load undetectable, maintain suppression. Doing what suppression. we're saying we can, we're already we're doing. doing. Yeah. If we can do that and do it well, I think in all likelihood we'll have an impact. Um, 
I think there are, though, the discussion of test and treat is, um, and at this conference has been focused on that, on this, but also on the broader question, should everybody with HIV, even if they don't need currently treatment mm -hmm. for their own oh, health, yeah. should they anyway be put on treatment mm -hmm. so they can prevent transmission to others? And I think that remains an open question. And there may be pushback or buy-in by everybody. I mean, you could have the yes. government, uh, uh, except for maybe industry, I don't know. Yeah, in, <laughs> but, yes, right, right. But right. you definitely have a uh, community that will say, well, why do I need it uh, just to, you know, for, you know, the uh, concern about infecting others. Right, and, right. But uh, there are some, uh, we're running a study, a survey yeah, ourselves yeah, to yes. find out those answers, yes. to feel it by, and, and I think it will maybe be the beginning of many others that will happen sure. earlier yeah. the better. Yes. So the other thing that, that you want to talk about is, um, is uh, uh, mother-to-child vertical transmission. Yes, yes. This is a big issue these days, and I think um, it's been mentioned in different settings yes. in, this, in this conference, yes. so it's a big concern ongoing. Mm. Yes, yes, it's a big concern, and prevention of vertical transmission from an HIV-infected woman to her baby is clearly an important priority, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the question is how to do it and do it right. I mean, in, in programs that I support myself and that we support in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a complex issue for a variety of reasons. Uh, nonetheless, I think it can be done. I think some of the complexities are that uh, you have to ensure that every pregnant woman gets for antenatal care so that she can be tested first. And in some countries, coverage with antenatal care is very high. In other countries, it's quite low where women, pregnant women, actually don't get, don't go to a clinic for antenatal care, and they deliver in the community, so you have really no chance of even testing them. So first step is to try to get as many pregnant women tested, obviously to identify those who are positive, and then to try to bring the most appropriate treatments to them. And we, we and others have been pushing for trying to do also CD4 test, testing on these women so that we can identify those who need treatment for their own health. Mm -hmm. Because if you can put them on treatment, that obviously is the best. And then best sustain way. it beyond. The, and then the, they need it beyond, beyond the delivery the, the because delivery that's for the, their own the, health. The nursing. Exactly. Space, so yeah. you can sustain it beyond that. Nonetheless, that is complex because obviously, uh, in some of the countries where very high rates of HIV, um, the healthcare system is not in, uh, strong enough to be able to do that, or it's hard to bring to keep these women in care. But I think it's not an insurmountable problem. I think it requires us thinking of uh, prevention of mother-to-child PMTCD rather than people have thought of it as a very simple intervention, just take one pill during labor and give one dose to the baby, that it's a process of engaging that HIV-infected woman into care for the duration of her life. Mm -hmm. and because, because she's, she's got to take she care has, of the child. She's or got to take yeah, right, children. the child and the children at home and also fits for her own benefit as well as for prevention of mother-child trans trans transmission. 